you know, Babs was probably the first of, would you say, a new style of coaching? You know what I mean? Like ultra prepared, like intense, like the practices were super intense, as I'm sure you knew. Like it was, you almost had to be more prepared than a game for practice, but they were quick, they were fast. And when you were done, you're like, okay. Like I found we practiced so hard that games, you almost had more time in games. Because that was Jason Krog, winner of the Hobie Baker Award in 1999 and also a player of 200 NHL games. And you are listening to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padolan. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello and welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast. I'm Jason Parole and I'm your host. And today we have a former teammate of mine and Hobie Baker winner, Jason Krog. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the uh, NCAA collegiate system, the Hobie Baker Award is the equivalent to the Heisman Trophy in collegiate football, which goes to the most outstanding player through all of collegiate sports. And uh, Jason was... Uh, able to call that his own uh, back when he played for the University of New Hampshire. Jason has quite a remarkable story uh, in such that, you know, we like to celebrate the journey here. And so many young Canadians and young Americans and young boys and girls across the world have this dream of playing in the NHL. And we have an assumption about who gets to do that and what type of player that player is when they're eight years old and what type of player that player is when they're 12 or 13 years old. And, um, and often it's surprising about who gets there. And Jason is, you know, true to that personal journey identity. Whereas we talk about the fact that when he was 16, uh, years old, he was not wanted necessarily anywhere on a junior level that he was, a hairline away from playing midget house hockey in his hometown uh, when a call for an expansion team in the Rocky Mountain League, uh, which, you know, nothing, nothing, taking nothing away from the Rocky Mountain League, but it's not a league that lots of players aspire to play in. Uh, sometimes it's just by no other choice that you have to go there. And Kragi went to a team uh, that was an expansion team, won five games that year, ends up making ends up making the team, of course, out of camp, uh, avoids, avoids house hockey midget. Two years later, he has a scholarship to UNH and uh, in the process gets passed over in the NHL draft, um, you know, twice in a row. So he's an undrafted player that gets a scholarship to to a Div 1 school uh, called University of New Hampshire, struggles his freshman year a little bit, and then finds his way, <clears throat> and finds his way all the way to being the best player in the nation, uh, which found him a free agent contract to the tune of seven figures to the New York Islanders. And a 200-game career later, and played into his late 30s as a pro, uh, won a scoring title in the AHL and championships, and really did a ton of things um got to a stanley cup final like it's just wild to me how you know what an what a huge player he was at the pro level and and what a key component he was um to his teams oh not to mention unh to be the best player in the country uh but to be somebody that was not necessarily recruited he said even to unh there was like unh and and maybe two schools in alaska or one school in alaska that uh that was recruiting him. So it wasn't like he was lauded. It wasn't like he was heralded that this was the next coming. Yet here he is. He goes about his business. Uh, his teammates loved him in UNH. He was a workhorse. He did the right things. Thought the game through. Played it the right way. Ends up winning a Hobie Baker and becoming an NHL player. Uh, when six years earlier, um, you know, like he says in the interview, he would he would probably not have guessed that would have been the outcome. So. Uh, Kragi's a great guy, super humble. I try to get him to boast a little bit about the Hobie Baker. Um, he forgot, <laughs> either he forgot, he didn't want to tell me like 
Toby Baker was a big deal. He ended up, the Islanders ended up bringing him into New York. He got to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. He didn't even bring that up. I found that out later. So anyways, uh, this guy is a riot. Um, he's a really good dude. He's working with kids now. We talk about that. Uh, he's helping uh, young players and giving back and helping them develop their skill and their mind to get ready for the next level. And uh, Kragi's done it all. He's, been, he's seen it all. Tons of different teams, trades, leagues, um, different roles. Uh, he's adaptable. He was flexible, uh, and more than anything, he was a great teammate. And he was, uh, and he was a really good guy to have in the locker room. So <clears throat> honored to have him. Uh, honored to have him on as a guest. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy this one. So without further ado, I bring you Jason Krog. All right, here we are, and I have a friendly face on, and Jason Krog. Welcome to the episode, Kragi. How you doing, bud? Good, buddy. Thanks for having me. It's been a while. It has been a while. You uh, you iced me there for what was it, six months yeah. without getting a yeah. response back? Yeah. I didn't even know if we were friends anymore. I knew I was going to hear it. <laughs> I'm not a big social media guy. What can I say? <laughs> well, you're not even that great at texting, though. Like, let's be That's honest. That's true. Yeah. Well, if you get an iPhone, maybe we can text a little bit more. <laughs> well, hey, man, I uh, I don't want to join the dark side again. My wife's there, and she thinks it's so much easier, and she just complains every day about her stuff. <laughs> so I don't know where we're at. Um, anyways, man, super cool to have you on. Um, as I said before, and for all of you listeners, um, Karagi and I go back, and we'll, we'll, we, we just spoke briefly before we got on. Um, to two different teams. So we'll have to reminisce on that. And both of us were acknowledging the fact that we don't have great memories. And I was almost not going to like do any research because I was like, oh, I know Kragi and whatever. We're going to roll this thing. So I, I rolled up the Hockey DB and it was like, wow, like a lot of, I mean, first of all, a lot of success, a lot of amazing stuff, but I'm sure there's a, like, it seems like there's a lot of adversity in this Hockey DB. Like, it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of teams. I know how hard that is. So anyways, I want to get into all of it. Um, and hopefully we have time because, uh, you know, yeah. I know you're, you're a pretty deep guy and your answers are going to be so insightful that um, we might, <laughs> we might just get stuck on the Chilliwack Chiefs and not get anywhere else. We'll have so. like five minutes and then I'll be out of words. <laughs> but yeah, I want to start with Chilliwack. Well, maybe even before that, because, um, you and I have some interesting parallels. I think it's going to be cool. Like once we get to like when we first met, because we went completely two different routes. And yeah. one of the things I love about this podcast is the fact that everyone's path is so much different. And when we met, we were at completely different points in our career. And, and the irony is kind of thick for, from there on out. But how about Chilliwack? Like Chilliwack, where did that come from? Did you always want to be a university guy? Did you have dreams or hopes of being a junior, a major junior player? Or how, how did that happen? I think if we rewind back even more, uh, you know, I was a late bloomer, I'd say. Uh, like, I would say good when I was younger. And then I think, you know, late maturing and kids kind of maybe caught up and passed me. You know, wasn't picked for like, I can't remember what it was back there, like the regional teams in BC or the best ever things and stuff like that kind of got passed over. Uh, and so I don't even think like major, obviously I it was in my mind, but I think, it just wasn't realistic. And then on top of that, my parents were big on school too. And I guess at one point, maybe Bantam, Midget, you know, I don't even know if hockey was, you know, realistic as a future, I guess. Uh, like I believe, again, my memory's bad, but first year Midget or second year Bantam, I actually took a year off of rep hockey and played house hockey and, uh, you know, chose to like do some skiing and, uh, it always messed up hunting season and stuff. So I did some hunting and stuff like that. And actually really fell in love with the game again. Um, in you know, house? Great, but yeah, in house hockey. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Maybe all the, you know, there's always politics and stuff like that going on in the rep hockey and stuff. And, you know, I don't know if it wore on me or what, but uh, yeah, I fell in love again playing house hockey. And from there, yeah, I played midget and then, you know, tried out for a bunch of junior teams and, you know, got cut. I made a couple of main camps, but didn't really go. Got cut at my hometown team, uh, the Ghost Riders. Got cut from junior B. And, you know, usually I did pretty well in the camps, like as far as like putting up points and that, but it was always size was an issue. And literally, I think it was two days before, or no, sorry. Yeah. Two days before like the Labor Day weekend, I think, uh, going into grade 12. 
uh, I got a call to go to Creston to try out for the expansion Creston Valley Thunder in the Rocky Mountain League. Um, and I ended up going there and end up making the team like total shock. So I ended up in the span of a week going from, you know, being ready to start school in Fernie for my grade 12 year to, you know, packing up and heading out and going away to play in Creston. And, you know, kind of went from there. I had a good year there. I think I got like rookie of the year and stuff like that. Real tough year though. Like we only won five games, I believe, and lost like 47. Oh. So really tough. Yeah. But, uh, you know, still great billets, great organization, great town, uh, faced a lot of adversity. Obviously, I'm sure, you know, being away from home in that. And then um, and how old were you? Is that a 16 year old year? Grade 12. So what would that be? I don't even know. Well, I don't know either. Cause I'm just looking at, um, why did it be 17 year old year? Well, your Chilliwack Chiefs at saying you were 17. Um, your okay, first well, year then, in Chilliwack. Okay, then I was 16 and then 17 in Chilliwack. So then from playing in Creston, I believe Harvey Smeal was the coach in Williams Lake. Yeah, but hold and on a second. So, so wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait. So, so you're 16. Yeah. And that is, I think back then, you're a year older than me. You're 75. A 16-year-old year, that would have been a first-year midget. So you could have played first-year midget. It must have See, been I think, I think I was later. I played a year of midget. Play to your midget. How'd you accomplish so, that? Uh, I don't know. Because I played 15 at BCJ uh, at 15, and that was my second year Bantam. I played one yeah. year Bantam, and then I went to the BCJ at 15. So for me, 16 would have been my first year midget, and I'm a 76 born. But neither here nor there. I was so let's turning just... 17, though, I think, probably, right? Right. Uh, I don't know. Anyways. But so you are close to being at home, is what you're saying. Like before this Creston thing rolls around, you got cut yeah, from the I junior B team. Yeah, I'm midget again. Yeah, and right, you're gonna go play else. midget. Yeah, make this Creston team have a good year, even though the team's crap. You get a taste of junior hockey, and now okay, so now this story comes that you get somebody gets looked at. You get looked at by somebody. Yeah, so the coach in Williams Lake was Harvey Smeal, and he ended up getting the job in Chilliwack, and I guess he saw something when we played against them uh, in the Rocky and he ended up trading for me, I guess in the summer. And then I ended up going to Chilliwack, going there, got injured in exhibition. So I missed like, I don't know, two, three months, uh, the beginning of the year and then finished the year pretty strong, you know, had a couple looks, I guess, with schools, but nothing uh, super serious. And then the fall of the game. Yeah. Decent, I guess. Yeah, that was good. But and I then mean, you, you back had dug then, the ass there. Yeah, I mean, we had a high, we had a good team, and you know, the league was pretty good then too. So a point of game wasn't good enough, I guess, for a scholarship. The next year, I came back, and we had even a better team, and uh, ended up going. We won the league and won BC, and then lost uh, against the AJ in Game Seven to go to their Royal Bank, and then so got a scholarship any- that year. Did anything change with you? You mentioned like size was always the issue. I mean, I, I you, what did you top out? Like 5'10"? Are you 5'10 you now? Is that what? Yeah, 5'10 and a half or something like that, yeah. Who's counting though, right? Yeah, yeah. 5'11". <laughs> so 5'10", so was that, was there a late growth spurt or was that just too small at the time? Or yeah, like I believe when I weighed in in Creston, I was about 150 pounds. And I want to say like 5'7 or maybe 5'8, something like that. Um, so yeah, it was small. So that was small. So you ended up putting on, putting on some weight. When did, uh, was the university time where you started to pack on the muscle or were you doing that already back in Chilliwack? Probably mostly university. I think just had time. It was good for me, right? I was a late bloomer and whatever else I had the time to develop. Right. Uh, same thing there. Struggled there a little bit my first year and then, yeah. But yeah, so Chilliwack, man. So you go from a point of game, um, I just love. I mean, that's what a crazy ascension, right? Like, not not uh, somebody doesn't think you're good enough to play junior B at, at sixteen, and then, you know, five years later, six years later, you're you're the best team in in the nation or best player in the nation at the collegiate level. Like, that's that's a wild ride. Even from sixty, like from fifty five points to one hundred twenty eight points that uh, that next year with with Chilliwack. Um, what was the what was the big difference there? Was there a difference for you? Um, like in the two years in Chilliwack. Well, yeah, just, I mean, that's a big, that's a big um, move. I don't know where that was in the league scoring, but like you must've been up there in that too. And to go to two points per game. That's yeah, I was impressive. top few, I think in that year. I mean, 
opportunity with some, like obviously getting hurt the first year and then coming into the lineup, you know, you always have to work your way in and, you know, there's kind of roles established and it's not like I didn't play, but I probably had a bigger role in my second year. Uh, and, you know, team success, we had a great team too. So, you know, you get chemistry and whatever else. And I think just mentally, I've always been a guy that kind of, you know, I learn as I go and, you know, after the first year, I was like, hey, here's what I need to do to be better and more consistent and um, just kind of carried that forward, I guess. Yeah. Right. So the, the first year you were there, um, you said you never got some looks from some schools. What about from the NHL? You you, were, you weren't drafted in your two years, but this year you were still eligible. This year you got this 128 points. Was there any, were you hoping, or was there any talk that maybe you might get taken? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, there was some, I think there's a few guys that did get drafted from the league, but um, back then it was, you know, big, you know, it was that everyone was drafting big, you know, prototypical six, two, six, three, big skaters, pretty heavy guys. Mm -hmm. uh, there was like, I've heard like little stuff, but I mean, realistically, it probably wasn't serious, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so that's uh that league, and I see you had 36 minutes in, in PIMS. Did would, did you, I mean, you were never really physical, right? I mean, you're, you, you you always used to kind of joke about that even. You know, I remember playing with you. But uh, yeah. but how was that? Because, I mean, you had your, the Rocky Mountain League was not an easy league. So now you're no. playing there as, as, as a young guy, probably getting, you know, <laughs> I don't know. There must have been a few stories there, at least seeing it and being exposed to it, meaning the physicality and dropping the gloves and maybe the odd uh, line yeah. brawl here and there. How did that ever play in and how did that affect you as a, as a player figuring that out? Um, yeah. I mean, the Rocky, you've probably heard stories about it too. It's a pretty tough league. And then on top of it, when you're on a team that's, you know, not winning a lot of games, you know, I can remember God, multiple nights after like the second period and it's, you know, we're down by five or six and, everyone's in the training room like wiping the Vaseline on their face and spraying that you know what I mean it's like we know this team's gonna try to pound us too like because we were young super yeah. young so they're like pounding us on the scoreboard they're gonna come out and pound us too so yeah I mean it was kind of trial by fire uh I remember getting into my first fight against Cranbrook I think it was uh yeah just we were losing a game on the road and you know just kind of got pissed off and ended up fighting a kid and it kind of happens, you know, the adrenaline and then whatever. And then, yeah, there's line brawls for sure. You know, a lot, uh, with our team is just because, like I said, we, you know, when games aren't close, it's like, that was just part of the game back then. It's, yeah. you know, send a message. No kidding. Did, um, so it wasn't anything again, like you never, you never ever struck me as a guy that was intimidated, um, which you mean your, your track record shows that too in the playoffs. You mean when the game's the toughest, you, you always were a good performer in the playoffs, but uh, did you find your niche there? Like as far as in the physical realm, like where that fit and whether fighting was going to be a part of your game or how it was ever going to fit in with you? Um, I mean, I actually liked hitting, like I, I didn't mind hitting. I felt like I was pretty decent at that. Like, you know, I, enjoyed that part of it. I was fairly sturdy on my feet and, you know, pretty good at anticipating and reading and could catch guys. And, you know, I understood that, you know, especially in juniors, you know, I know I hit a guy and then it was like, okay, you have to almost fight. Right. But at the same time, when you're, I found the more I became a skill guy, it's like you had other people that were doing it more often and almost like we're protecting you. So, uh, yeah. You know, it's not that I didn't want to. I, it's like I didn't enjoy it, but, you know, it's part of the game. You just understand it. it's kind of like you just have to do it. And, you know, the physical part of it, I was fine with it in the playoffs and that I can take a cross check. And, you know, probably from playing in the Rocky Mountain League and wherever else, like, you know, you take a lot of shots, cheap shots and whatever. But, I mean, you got to get back up. Yeah. Yeah. I could never imagine doing that as a as my job you know, like, oh, yeah, at, at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, and I found like the more and I think that's probably with most guys, like I, I the most I ever fought was my 16 year old year in the WHL. And I think it was just because of the league. I think it was because you're trying to establish yourself. You know, I think it's guys yeah. are testing you. I think it's a lot of things. I remember yeah. my first year pro too. It was kind of the same. Like you guys are just feeling each other out. And then as it goes, you kind of just sort of find your place, you know, and uh, yeah. I always found myself usually fighting for somebody other rather than for myself, you know, like is usually how, yeah. how it would go. And yeah, um, 
You mentioned when the when the I, I want to touch on a, this a little modern day hockey question here because it struck me as like it really struck me and it was when you when you mentioned there well you know when the game got out of hand that it was going to get physical and that's just kind yeah. of like that was the game that we grew up in right like yeah yeah and usually when you're on the losing side because you know you're getting pounded the coach is back there he's huffing and puffing and you know you're expected to show that you're upset or mad or you're not going to get walked on which I guess is kind of the underlying theme of this However, at the NHL level this year, the Philadelphia Flyers got beat nine nothing, and yeah. there wasn't one fight. Like I, I was just like awestruck by that. The Philadelphia yeah. Flyers, right? Too like this is like a, a yeah. franchise, no. right? Like that's just been growing on 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 toughness and on nails, and there wasn't one fight. And I was just like, wow, man, this game has changed like yeah. a lot. Like, do you see that as being shocking still to you? Do you think that's the future, or should it? Should they have pushed back? Like, where are you at with the whole? I think modern that day? it's it's kind of gone too far one way, almost. If that makes sense, you know what I mean. Maybe back in our time, it was like too regular, as far as you know. It's just like let's brawl or let's line brawl, and you know, it was just unpredictable. But now, yeah, it's like you want to leave with some sort of a positive impact or something that you care. Like, you know what I mean? That's what I feel like it is. And if you just yeah. kind of lay down and just get kicked around and not do anything, uh, like how do you bounce back after that? I guess like, yeah. you know, you got to hate to lose, right? I don't know. That's how I was taught anyways. Like you, you got to hate to lose. Yeah. So, um, I think we're seeing some more physicality coming into Like, you know what I mean? I think, you know, watching the Stanley Cup playoffs, you see that teams, you know, whether it's that Tom Wilson or Reeves or, you know, bigger, more physical teams seem to be doing well. And they, the guys that will hit and drop the gloves, like, they have a big impact on the series. Like, they can change the series around pretty quick. So I would suspect that, you know, there'll be some mean reversion as far as, you know, fighting coming right. back into the game and uh, bigger guys, yeah. Yeah, I think you put that great. I mean, <clears throat> hate to lose. Like that's not, and that's totally not what I saw in that game. And I, get, I was, I mean, I was yeah. sitting here. My audience was my uh, was my three boys listening to me, like be awestruck by this. I'm like, they're not going to make yeah. the playoffs. Like, I mean, this was of almost three weeks ago, a month now. Right? Yeah. Like, there's no way. Like, how you said, how do you bounce back from that? Like, there was no. But, push but didn't back. they lose another game almost like the same, like two weeks later, a week later? Yeah. Close, exactly. And there was, I looked on that game and they, they had one or two fights. Not, not yeah, that that establishes I mean, anything, but they were trying to figure it out. And even in their press yeah. conferences after, right? They're like, we yeah. don't know what we stand for. We don't know what our identity is. Like the, yeah. like the last things you want to come out of a, of a yeah. team locker room. But um, yeah. yeah, it just looked like they didn't care. Like they, like they were okay with it. And I guess, uh, yeah, for me, not to be a dinosaur, but like even if you're pretending, <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like yeah. you, you should do yeah. something, yeah. I think, you yeah. know? Um, yeah, anyways, so, okay. So you get the, uh, so you got the, do you, you got a full ride. I, I take it to UNH, which is like yeah. a, a, a big school. Um, what was that recruitment process like for you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I did like three fly downs. I think I went to the two Alaska schools and then to New Hampshire. Um, uh, even I would say, you know, as good as the year was, um, you know, a lot of, I would say the big schools, you know, weren't that involved, you know, back then the big schools would be like BU, Maine, Michigan, Michigan state, like Denver. Uh, so I would say UNH would have maybe been considered like a second tier school gotcha. as far as, um, so I wasn't like, it's not like I had like 20 different offers or something like that. Um, so I was just happy, uh, as far as, you know, for me, coming from a small town, I didn't really want to go to a big school anyways. Um, so it made sense to go there. The assistant coach was a Western Canadian guy. Um, the campus, going out to campus, it was kind of set away from the city, kind of out of, on its own. And it was a walking campus, you know, 15,000 people, brand new rink. Uh, the program was doing pretty good. Like they, they'd started to kind of turn the corner. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a good fit for me, I thought. What was your mindset like walking in there? I mean, you just came off of, I mean, obviously a killer year. Um, did you say you won the RBC Cup or you got to? No, no, no. We lost uh, in game seven to the Calgary Canucks, I think it was, and they went on to win the RBC, yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, man, we had awesome year, though. You win the BCJ, which is which is usually a, a ticket right to the RBC. Uh, you ran yeah. a good team in the AJ. Yeah. And, um, 
and yeah, and got your D1 scholarship. So what do you, like confidence must be pretty high, I would assume, rolling into UNH or where there's some nerves involved? I was never, I would say, a high confidence guy. Um, like, I think from not, you know, I, I listened to a few of your part, like, you know, you played like the World Juniors and everything like that. And I was, like I said, I came into things and, you know, I didn't expect anything. I didn't know what to, what I was getting into. It's not like I walked in and was like, oh, I'm going to get, you know, a point a game or two points a game or whatever. I was kind of go in, kind of mind my own business, see how everything goes at college, get set up and kind of build from there. And yeah. I guess that's how it was. It was even like, I would say it was a slow start probably, you know, they were probably like my first year, you know, they probably expected more, I'd say the first half of the year, but it took me some time to find my way and figure out the game. Like, you know, I'm a thinker. So, you know, the college game, it was a bigger ice surface, you know, just a different style of game from playing in Chilliwack on a small rink where, you know, you have very limited time and space, like guys are running around. It was more controlled and speed and stuff like that. So it took me some time. And then as soon as I, you know, started, I popped a couple goals later on, like, you know, maybe to like win a game or something like that. And then it kind of snowballed from there, you know, like your confidence builds and yeah. finished the first year, you know, decent is if you look like i probably had four points halfway through the year and then the last half of the year i probably you know i don't know i probably got 15 or 18 points in the last you know 18 20 games or whatever right. it was and then kind of took off from there yeah so you're trying to figure everything out you I mean any place new is like that like you know as you said yeah but i feel the- like there's guys that are good at kind of just blocking stuff out and going in and they just you know they just go and they right. do well and can step into things and whatever whereas yeah I feel like I'm not like that. Do you feel like you weren't like that the entire time, like throughout your entire career, or did you get better at navigating new spots? Um, I mean, I just, I probably got better, but at the same time, I think, you know, that was just kind of, I was always observing, always learning, trying to pick things up and try to figure things out and get better. And I think that's why I lasted so long was I was always, it's not like I was ever comfortable or complacent, right? Or thought that my game was just where I wanted to be. It was like always trying to pick up things. Yeah. All right. So halfway through that first year, I mean, that is usually, I mean, can be like the hardest year, right? That, that really, that first big move, you know, the away, yeah. whether that be major junior or university and things aren't going well. What was the support like inside that locker room? Did you feel like the coaches were, you know, helping you or did you feel like you're a little bit lost there for a while or how'd that go? I think they were pretty good. I mean, the head coach was tough. But like going in all the seniors and upperclassmen, it was like he treated all the freshmen like that. The first year was kind of like you earn your stripes, right? It's like you don't get anything. It's like he he did not disrespect you, but it's like it's a freshman and then it's like the upperclassmen. And uh, so I wouldn't say he was easy on us or me or like the group, but uh, the assistant coaches were good at kind of, you know, keeping tabs on you and telling you this and kind of keeping your your confidence up and you know i think the balance of it helped out it's like you know how it was back then too in juniors it's like your rookie year like you gotta you're a rookie you gotta earn it so i was used to that and um you know the group was good too good leadership group good guys you're all in it there the one thing about college is you know you're stuck with that group for the year you know at least if not four years with your classmen so you know everyone's there kind of you know, on the same boat and trying to do the same thing. Right. Yeah. yeah they, um, what was the rookie initiate? Like, was there initiation stuff? Like it was it to the typical stuff you had to pack the bus or like whatever, like that kind of stuff. Or was there, yeah, stuff there was that out? stuff. And then we did some, they would do things like, you know, back then, I think it was like the first day before school Our phone rang at like uh, midnight in our dorm. And they're like, let's go up to the, like the hockey house and you'd have to go up there and, you know, have to you know chug a few beers and dance around or something. You know, I do something <laughs> stupid, but, uh, right. you know, they're pretty good. It probably could have been, it was worse. I'm sure at some places and, but, uh, you know, it was all in good fun. And, yeah. 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 I never had any, uh, I mean, God, I mean, what came out in the news there a little while ago, there were some horror, horror stories, right? Yeah. Like the Dan Carcillos and stuff. I mean, I never yeah. had any of that, um, at all personally. And again, I'm not, saying that it didn't happen in other places, but yeah. I guess fortunate, I, I guess, you know, and it, I think it is part of that environment, right? Like how those, how those veterans were probably treated is, 
you know, they, it's yeah. usually the way it goes, right? I mean, yeah. they treat you probably accordingly. And I obviously I was in a must have been in good, some good environments there. The yeah. Chiefs, the Chiefs was good. And you know, I mean, anywhere else I was in, whether it's NHL or AHL, it was always, it was always good. Just I even mean, relatively good fun. And I'm sure even the stuff we did then is probably frowned upon now, but it was yeah. nothing, yeah. nothing too serious. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you go from, so from your freshman year, like having to close it out, and then you then you kind of you start tearing it up and 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 consistently too. Uh, you're a big player on the Division One circuit uh, to the point that you you win the trophy as being acknowledged as the best player in the in the nation. Uh, that's a big deal, man. Like, uh, talk about that. Like, just talk about what, how how that how that happened. I mean, how the team, maybe or the coaches, or all of that stuff, and 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 what that meant to you, and what it meant to the University of New Hampshire. That you were probably a pretty big kid on campus there that last year. Yeah, I mean, very fortunate, I think, to play on, I guess, teams that suited my style. You know what I mean? Like my last three years, we had you know, top offensive teams in the nation and our forwards were, you know, we every year had six, eight guys that were like elite. I think if you looked at, you know, down our team uh, each year, you know, a lot of guys had a lot of points and we played like a run and gun game. And so it was good for me. Uh, you know, I don't know the individual awards. It's, it, it is what it is. Uh, I think the reason why, you know, the last year I got that award was, my junior year, I almost left. Like I was super close to signing um, and going to the NHL because I was a free agent, never drafted. And, uh, you know, so many guys left. Like another, my roommate left and signed with St. Louis. And then we lost probably five, four, no, four of the, our top six forwards, I guess, you know, that were all like, you know, all American caliber guys. And so my coming back my senior year, we probably weren't expected to be that good right like uh you know all our studs were gone and um we ended up just you know having a great team team where you know everyone bought in you know the young guys the freshmen that came in you know really stepped up and you know sophomores and juniors you know just everyone bought in and did you know understood their role accepted their role did their part and yeah it was just uh, a fantastic year that way so fun and you know when you're overachieve i guess then makes a big difference we went all the way to the uh final four and lost in the overtime in the final game um so it's other than heartbreaking it was nice to to finish the year fairly well yeah right well you know who yeah. uh who i'm buddies with now and we, our kids are on the same team is sean matil oh no way yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh so i've heard a few stories from tiller Tell yeah. me how great he was at uh at university so uh i'll uh i'll have to yeah. get you guys together <laughs> He added about a hundred thousand onto our stick budget. Every what? practice, whenever he got, oh, he's always breaking sticks or chucking sticks. <laughs> he hated to get scored on. That's always good. No, he was. Oh, that is good. He was an elite goalie. Yeah. Yeah. And he's big and fast. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah, he uh, he is a good guy, and he told. Yeah. He, I guess he was on the bench that last game, and it still kills him to this day that uh, that he never had a chance to play to play yeah. in it. Um, yeah. But. Uh, well, yeah, okay. I know you are a humble guy, but I honestly want to make that's like the Heisman. Like, how big of a deal was it in that school? Like, was it were you massively celebrated? Um, like, what? How did that whole thing go down? I guess probably. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, if you won a huge award, like, are you? You know, you're, you're a pretty humble guy too. So, I don't know. It, it was like I was celebrating with my team, and you know. I, but did the school I, do anything about it? Like, was it like a ticker tape parade yeah. type deal, or like what was? No, how I don't they think so. I mean, there was. We were out in Anaheim when they did the presentation and that, and you know, I'm sure it was a big deal. But uh, you know, I, I know, and I'm not naive to the fact that you know, you know, the coaches and my teammates and everything like that had just as big of a part of it as I did. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, I was fortunate to get the opportunity and play with the guys, and you know. It, you don't win individual awards without having team success. So, you know, anyone who thinks that's crazy. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. You mentioned that you almost left. Um, what was that first year of getting, you know, I, you are a free agent, so you can negotiate. You can sign or you don't have to sign. You're yeah. not bound by the NHL yeah. draft. It's a massive advantage of actually getting getting uh, whatever you call them, picked over or whatever, or passed over, I should say, in the NHL yeah. draft. Uh, what was what was close? Like, what were you thinking of doing there that, that junior year? 
Um, Edmonton actually uh, made an offer. And I mean, it got to a point where, you know, we were probably within, I don't know, 50,000, I guess, or something like that of, you know, it was mainly signing bonus back then. Um, yeah. And it was kind of like my agent was like, well, if you get this, then I think you should go. If you don't, then whatever. And, you know, they ended up coming up and, you know, ended up working out, I guess, for me. Right. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to talk money or not, but I assume waiting was a financial advantage after winning yeah. the Hobie yeah. Baker. Yeah. yeah. And I just, in hindsight, I just don't think I was ready. You know, I just wasn't ready. So it was right. probably good for me. Yeah. And so how does that go? I mean, are you, I'm just thinking you like through the eyes of you, right? Like your, your, your path to there to signing, um, you know, six, seven figure signing bonus at the end of your senior year, best team, best player. Like, did you, ever have like dreams, hopes, ideas that that was possible, that this was going to happen? Like was the NHL, like when did the NHL come on your radar that this is, this is a potential thing for me? Yeah. It's such a tough question. Cause I know obviously growing up, you know, every Canadian kid you're playing in the drive or whatever, it's like, yes, but you know, I wasn't, it's not like it was realistic for me, I guess most of the time. And even it was kind of like, Oh, can I play junior? Oh, I made junior. Awesome. And it's like, can I get a scholarship? Oh, unreal i got get to go to university and play four more years of hockey and then you know like i said probably not until my junior year it's like okay well there's a chance i'm going to get an nhl contract out of this and i'm going to be so yeah it's i guess probably my junior year and you know it's it's a good thing but also a bad thing that i probably didn't set the bar maybe high enough and and you know that's maybe why i say going to college is maybe why i struggled a little bit my first year because yeah the um that the whole college landscape I, I've said here on this on this podcast before I would have liked to have participated in it and just experienced it because yeah uh you know even though I like we came at it from different angles and I was you know a highly touted younger guy and drafted yeah. high I I don't think necessarily that I was ready at twenty for everything that happened you know, or 21, yeah. like it would have been nice to maybe have two games and get physically more mature and, you know, and get your head a little bit in a better spot. Um, were you, at what point did you become a professional about your game or did you become a professional about your game at that university level? Like where you're thinking about, you know, tomorrow and what do I need to improve and how am I going to get better? I think just the, yeah, I mean, the situation there, you you know, the, the ice is open a lot of times, so we could go on early, we could stay out late. The gym is kind of like you can go whenever you want. And, you know, I, had a, I was lucky to have a group of freshmen, you know, roommates and whatever else that were pretty motivated too. So, you know, we became gym rats and, you know, would always go out. We were competitive within each other. And uh, so I think that unknowingly we were getting better, getting stronger and, you know, go out before practice, work on stuff, stay after practice, compete, play games to whatever scoring or or whatever it was. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like I said, unknowingly, I was probably doing it there and, you know, trying to work on my game all the time. And it was the right atmosphere for our environment, I guess, to, to have it because not, you don't always have access to all that stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And that's probably the first time I remember. I didn't even know I was working on it too. I mean, you mentioned that like, yeah, I wish I became more professional about it when I was a professional, like actually being yeah. intentional about things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my practice was more or less just passion. Like I just loved being yeah. on the ice, you know. Yeah. So I remember being in Spokane, it was the same thing. There was, you know, hockey wasn't necessarily big there as far as from a youth level. So we had the arena there and it was just kind of our arena. So like we, yeah. after school, we would go on early. I remember Dave Lomanowitz and I like staying out till our trainer would like shut the lights off on us. And it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like, Hey, I'm working on my one timer or I'm working on, it was just like, I just love to be out there. And Dave and I would go, you know, break away after break away for hours. You know what I mean? Like it was just fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Cause there's a way, I don't know. I talk about deliberate practice now with a lot of my clients, you know, like, you want to have the passion to be on the ice, but if you can have that passion to be on the ice, then also uh, have the t- type of focus to be deliberate about what it is you're doing. Um, boy, you can even you can compound that interest, that investment, right, of actually being out there. And that was one thing that I never really quite got as a as a pro, and I wish I wish I did. Uh, you mentioned yourself being more of a thinker. Did you did you get to that spot with with your game? I think as I got older and. Yeah, matured 
for sure I paid more attention to, you know, all the things like whether it's nutrition, sleep, um, you know, the way I prepared for practice, the way I prepared for games, the way I, you know, recovered after games. Uh, and it went from even the extra time I put on the ice, you know, instead of like you talked about it, just working on one timers or, you know, things that might happen once every three games to more working on, you know, game situational things, whether it's, you know, stuff that have, whether it's a power play or something that, you know, setting up on the power play or two on ones or, you know, whatever it may be, smaller stuff down low, working in the corners, uh, you know, so I think that helped. And even now, you know, doing some development in the game, you know, I wish, like you said, it's like, could have done so much more and probably been more efficient if you you knew what you could to work on. Yeah. And back then, you know, I think skill development was kind of a new thing. You know, I would say it wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't like there were skill coaches and that until later in my career. Uh, so yeah, we were kind of on our own figuring it out and, you know, some guys just got it and then others kind of didn't pay attention to it and didn't worry about it. And, yeah. Yeah. You're hundred percent right. I mean, yeah. people probably listening now in, in like this generation that kids are growing up in, like there wasn't skilled development. It sounds such a yeah. weird thing to say, but yeah. like you, you had this set of tools that you arrived in the scene with and like, those were your tools. And I remember yeah. like guys that would work hard or professional, uh, at least on the teams that I played with were the guys that, yeah, would show up early to the games, you know, or to practice. They would get yeah. their workouts in. They would take care of themselves physically, right? Like that was part of being professional, but you didn't see guys like actively improving their hands or working on, you know, their foot speed necessarily. Or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that stuff was just sort of like static. And um, it's interesting too, because I've said on this podcast before too, like once I started becoming uh a pro I almost went the other way like I thought it was like established and it became a job that I I didn't really actively seek to improve I, almost yeah. because I almost didn't think I could I think like subconsciously yeah. you yeah. know like yeah. that there wasn't even really anywhere else to go so why am I going there you know but yeah I I, I found myself getting worse because of it because like, I mean because I, I <laughs> yeah, became yeah. just yeah. more of like a professional I showed up yeah. for games I showed up for practice and I wasn't actively improving it's it's a uh, so wild like and then you watch these examples of guys now um, with this new growth mindset and I mean, deliberate practice and like skills coaches and like, man, like, where does it stop? Like, it doesn't have to stop. That's what's like yeah. so exciting right now. And, and you well, see what the like players you're working with. There were so many different types of players. Like when we, you know what I mean? Yeah. There was like small, speedy, big, maybe slower, you know, all this stuff. And like, everyone was kind of put in a role. And whereas now it's like, like you said, it's like, everyone can do everything. It's like, the small guys can play physical. The big guys have good foot speed. They can turn quick. They can transition. And so you have to be able to do everything. And yeah, like I wish you probably do too. Like you wish you would have worked on some of your weaknesses to make you more a complete player earlier in your career. And then you have a, you know, it's easier to find ways to make it right. Instead of just being, okay, he's this and, or he's this. Thank you so much for listening today, and I appreciate all the reviews and all the support. Uh, and all of you who are writing in, uh, wondering about what next year looks like, and if you are a coach or if you are a programmer or if you are a general manager and you want to add mindset, support, and training to your players, uh, I might be the guy that you want to talk to. So. You can look me up at www.upmyhockey.com. Uh, my list of team services is there. Uh, I'm available through email. Of course, uh, with the contact me portion of the website, uh, would love to chat and see if we're a good fit. Uh, schedule is filling up, and uh, it's amazing to see uh, where teams are calling in from and who's interested. So, yeah, if you're an academy, a junior hockey program, a professional team, um, even a, a high development youth program, uh, I would love to speak with you. Um, no age is too early, but my sweet spot is probably 12 and up. Uh, if you're in the youth hockey categories and obviously junior hockey is what junior hockey is. Uh, and there's a lot to be gained at that age group when people are really trying to push for either, you know, NHL drafted players, get NHL contracts, get to D1 scholarships, make junior teams. Um, there's, there's a lot at stake. And sometimes the difference for a lot of these players is learning how to think 
away from the rink, how to apply intention to their development, uh, and to recognize the self-awareness about where they need to get to and have a plan to get there. So I would love to support any program that's out there. Um, once again, www.upmyhockey.com. Uh, let's have a discussion and see if we can figure something out. Now back to the podcast with Jason Krog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Fill in your own holes. Yeah. The more adaptable you can be. We've talked about that lots, right? Like trying to, you know, again, you with 85 points at the University of New Hampshire, you you show up on the scene and, you know, you're not going to be a top line forward, most likely in the NHL in your rookie yeah. year, right? Like you have to find yeah. a way to be uh, of service to that team, right? Yeah. And how, how do you do that? Yeah. Um, if you're not on the PP, doing what you want to do, which is tossing sauce yeah. to the back door, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's a way that you have to recreate yourself. Um, so you step out, so you, you get a, <clears throat> you get a big hefty signing bonus. You're, you're yeah. the, you're the, you know, you're the meal deal, full meal deal. And then, and the Islanders sign you, and that's when you and I cross paths. And that's why yeah. this to me, now when I'm looking back on it, cause I didn't even really reflect on it at the time in the moment, but I was in my, I think it was my fourth year pro at that point. And it was your first year pro and yeah. You were the shiny new penny, and I was like the old dog that you wanted to kick down the street. You know what I mean? And it was like, it was just like that's just so weird. And that's the hockey world, right? Because now yeah. you're you're new, or you've just you've done all this stuff. I had done this stuff, but I'd kind of had my chance in the NHL, and it was like nobody wanted to give me another one, you know. And I was like yeah. this guy, um, and there we were in the same team, you know. Like, can you talk about your your first year of professional hockey and and you mentioned you're having a little bit of a hard time adapting sometimes to new situations or like figuring it out like what was that transition like for you yeah I, again i didn't know a ton about professional hockey i guess from being in a small town uh you know the guys i trained with i knew a little bit uh this guy derek becker came back and trained but you know i did it's not like i was around pros all the time that told me what to expect and you know what to look for and all this stuff so going into training camp you know i worked hard in the summer um looking back i don't know how smart but i worked i always worked hard right mm -hmm. uh you know went in did good on uh, the fitness tests and all that stuff had a decent camp and got sent down you know like last day of camps or whatever you know i don't know they probably i don't know whether they expected me to make it or they didn't expect whatever but uh you know didn't have a great exit meeting with uh the brass you know it was like that was milbury at the time wasn't it yeah 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 so there's been he, some did, he good... didn't sugarcoat things he's like the... you're too small and like whatever like go down there and whatever says so well like, give us the list because i've heard some milbury stories before and it's good for people to hear it too i mean like i mean just so you can be in your shoes right like to hear those words in real time like from somebody that's an executive that has control over your future like what 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 was said and, and how did he say uh it? Well, I mean, you know, you're on pins and needles all training camp pretty much, right? And then, yeah, I remember getting called in the last day and you go into like the office and you have, you know, Milbury and the scouts and whatever there. And, you know, one side is like, oh, I think I did all right. You know, fitness testing went good. I put up some points and whatever else. And then he was pretty much just like, you know what? You know, it wasn't what we expected. And, uh, you know, you're just, I don't know if you're big enough to play in this league and fast enough and on and a la la la. And I walk out of there. I'm like, Oh my God, what did I do here? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but whatever, then you get, I get sent down to Lowell and, you know, so went there, you know, in the hotel forever, like, cause they didn't tell you what you're doing or, you know what I mean? It's like, and then it was run, what was it? Two thirds LA Kings and then one third Islanders. You know, and then even there coming in, like you said, I was, you know, a rookie and, you know, LA had their top prospects there. And, you know, looking back, there was like, we had a lot of good players there. And, you know, like we were pretty deep down the middle too. So even, you know, you know, thinking that I would get a decent opportunity there, I was, you know, in and out of the lineup at times. Like I got healthy scratched a couple of times and, you know, there was older guys, veterans at center. And, you know, I got a few looks on the power play and that, but I wouldn't say, you know, I got a ton and it's, you know, it's, it was a battle to get ice time and, you know, I probably didn't deal with it as well as I probably could. And then, yeah. Well, not, and yeah, let's, let's, let's dig into yeah. that a little bit because I mean, um, there's a lot of crap going on there. I mean, and 
like I love that mindset side. You go from being the best player in the nation to getting told by Mike Milbury that this isn't what I, we expected. I don't know what we got here, but you're too small and you're not quick enough yeah. or whatever else he said. Now you're in a hotel in Lowell, Mass, of all places, yeah. not knowing if you're coming or going. You can't get in the lineup. You know, uh, Hockey DB says you got six goals in 45 games. Like there must have been a roller coaster going on for you, like on the emotional, mental side. Um. Yeah, for sure. It was a struggle, but I mean, I feel like I've been there before, so it's not like I'd given up or anything like that. And I, I guess I wish of wish I would have had a little more direction as to what I needed to work on and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's pro is a little more every man for themselves, and then I think having two organizations where you have one coach from one organization, one coach from another, and you know, all these prospects together, it even gets a little more every man for himself in a yeah. sense. And, you know, we probably should have realized that if we worked together more, all of us would have had more success, you know what I mean? And, or talked about stuff. Um, so, yeah, I remember just, yeah, kind of going through, waiting for my opportunity. And then I ended up getting called up, I think. But then I got hurt. I got hurt that first year. I broke my jaw. Uh, and then at the end of the year, I got called up to the Islanders and then I got hurt in Nashville too. I, uh, high ankle sprain. So I was out like two months and then they put me back in Providence that year. Did you get hurt in, in the NHL? Was that where you got your high ankle sprain? Yeah. In a pregame skate. Oh, wow. Well, it means yeah. at least your timing was right. Cause they had to pay you. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like a good thing, but it would have been nice to, you know, play, play. the games. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, and you mentioned direction and I thought that was a really interesting word because, you know, I I've shared on, on this podcast before when I got traded to Toronto the first time and just the lack of direction, like complete lack at the NHL level, right. They've just traded yeah. their assistant captain for a 20 year old uh, goal scorer and like almost next to nothing's being said. Right. Yeah. Um, which blows me away. I mean, and here the Islanders are, you I mean, just invested a million dollars in, into you. And yet, you know, you're, you're left to try and figure it out. Right. Like instead of like being uplifted and supported, I know the game is changing a little bit now and that doesn't happen, but like how, how deafening was the silence or who was talking to you at that point? Gordy Clark. I remember he talked to me a few times and just said, Hey, you got to get faster or whatever, but it's like, how, how do I get fast? Like, it, I don't even think it was getting faster. It was more like I needed to, to think the game faster, you know, and looking back, like, you know, I, the game was faster and everything, there was less time and space. And I decided to, you know, to work on things for that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I probably could have dealt with it better. You know what I mean? I should have put it more on myself to reach out or to, but there was that respect factor of, you don't want to be like that whiny guy or, you know what I mean? It was kind of keep your mouth shut, especially your first year. It's like, you don't want to be going up to the coach. Like, what can I do better? It's like, you know how it was back then. Yeah. It's like, yeah. look at this guy, brown <laughs> noser. You know what I mean? Like brown noser, like right. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Right. There's like, and I'm packing those dynamics and like, who is teaching you that? Like, that's the other thing is like why I love what I'm doing now. Because when I talk with players, whether it's on a team or on an individual basis, like that stuff still happens. And those like social intricacies, right? The nuances of that, of like being on a team, how to say what and when, how to still keep respect amongst your peer group, yet keep your personal goals and, and, you know, and, and kind of your pride intact. Like it's hard. It's super hard. Right. Like, um, and then, yeah, I mean, God, you're on a team full of like, you know, gladiator testosterone filled men right like it's like there's so much weirdness that's going on there um and yet you still are an emotional human being at the end of the day you know that's trying to deal with stuff and uh putting it all together with your own expectations and oh my god i can just i can feel for you and and i mean and that start of that did you ever have a place that you would have called home that year because you were between the islanders and lowell and then you're also in um providence Providence. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I was in the hotel for a while, and then I went to um, – I got a place in Nashua, I believe, actually, or with La Luongo. Yeah, Clock Tower. Yeah. Weren't you guys in Clock Tower? Uh, that was Maybe the second not. year. The first the first year, we were just, like, in a different place. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so me and Luongo were roommates, 
And I mean, he was hardly there and then I was hardly there. And then, like you said, yeah, I got called up one time and they got sent down to Providence because I think I wasn't playing, you know, as much as they liked in Lowell because they were deep down the middle with LA's prospects and things actually ended up going really well for me in Providence. Uh, You know, I just, they threw me right into the mix, you know, in the top six and I ended up getting hot there and, and whatever else. So then I was in the hotel there and then, yeah, I got called up to the Islanders. Like I said, they got hurt there and then was in the hotel there for a couple months and they got sent down to Providence for the playoffs. And then, yeah, I was in the hotel for another couple months. We ended up playing you guys actually in, uh, in Lowell. We went all the way to the conference finals. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, so definitely no, I wasn't settled. I spent the whole year eating, you know, eating out and, Right. Sleeping in hotel rooms and yeah. making new teammates and like I mean that's yeah. the, that's the crazy part is like those dressing room dynamics and different coaches and different places and no home and you're just playing you know you're trying to hockey's the only thing that's the backbone right of everything yeah. and you just know you're going to the rink and you just don't know where you're showing up um rookie year is hard enough with that I mean I had the same experience I had three teams my rookie year too um no I lied I had five teams my rookie year I had Florida five teams? Florida, Carolina, on all four. Florida, Carolina, Toronto, and St. John's in one year. Um, that's a lot, man. Um, a lot yeah. of different areas too. It's hard to it's hard to navigate. What was the turning point for you? You mean you kind of? I mean, you had a great. I mean, actually, you mentioned Providence. I mean, your, your stats to say right there. You mean seventeen points in eleven games as a pro. That's uh, nine goals. That's those are big numbers. Those are real healthy numbers. Um, but it wasn't enough to get you that NHL spot or that NHL job at that point. And you had a couple more seasons uh, in the, in the AHL last of which was probably your coming out party with us in, uh, in Bridgeport there when we went to the finals against Chicago and you were, you were, I think second on our team in points that year, if I remember correctly, uh, was that, was that season like the, the one where you kind of established yourself and maybe had started to have the belief that you could be successful as a pro or real successful? Um. I think Providence was the eye opener for me. And then even my second year uh, camp went, you know, I felt like camp went well and, you know, getting sent down, it was kind of obvious to me that they just, you know, didn't like me that much. I would say maybe that's not my own thing. I thought, but whatever. And I went down to Lowell and even in Lowell that year, uh, things went really well there. And then uh, were you there that year? That was the year where, probably like two months in uh we were no. had a practice and after practice uh remember you know Sterls obviously Steve yeah. Sterling he said hey there's an Islander workout after practice so we all went into the gym and uh did a workout and then after the workout everyone else had left and there's like the eight Islander guys or seven Islander guys and that's um when he told us that hey our affiliation with Lowell's done go pack up your stuff and uh get out of your leases cancel your bills and tomorrow morning come to the rink at 6 a.m and grab your gear and it was like four guys are going to springfield and a couple guys are going to chicago i can't remember where a couple guys went yeah so now i'm going to springfield um for god i don't know how long got called up there that's crazy. um yeah and then back and forth i was back and forth from the islanders that year too a little bit and then i think i got hurt there again I started actually getting the groove with the Islanders and uh, I dislocated my shoulder and then I missed like, yes, six, seven weeks there. Given, and then, given a hit or taking a hit? Uh, I kind of got hit from behind and then I put my arm out when I was going into the boards. And then, yeah, my third year I actually made the team out of camp and I dislocated my shoulder in practice. Uh, oh, I got hit low. A guy ducked me and then... And that's when I came to Bridgeport after that, right? Gotcha. I was hurt. I got hurt in camp and then I came to Bridgeport, whatever it was, six or seven weeks or probably a month after camp because I could skate and then, yeah, started up there. Do you remember that and, Steve Sterling story with Dave Roach? I'll bring you back. So remember we were on, we were on uh, I was hurt. I didn't get hurt too often, but I was hurt on the road uh, in St. John's. So you can imagine me in St. Yeah. John's after playing there for three years and hurt, right? So I was like yeah. the tour guide. and. The mayor. Uh, <laughs> the mayor and they traded Rochi. Remember when they traded? Yeah, yes, Rochi? yes, I do remember this. 
And um, so they traded Rochi on on the rock, which is like the probably the best place to ever get traded from. So we're out with him that night, and I'm like the ringleader. Um, all you guys go home. I think we were leaving. I remember this, yeah. Doesn't really matter. Probably, probably made fun of us for going home early. Yeah, yeah, sure probably. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. And um, and so we're getting Rochi screeched in, right? Like or there was a yeah. few of us left there at the time. And so Rochi, I mean, Rochi's a puddle at this point. I apologize, Dave, if you hear this. I'm sure you I mean it's uh I hope I'm not putting any bad light on you. This was, was not this was pretty harmless, but we got a few beers in them. And um and the <laughs> I think it's an Alabama song. Um, if you're gonna play in Texas, you gotta have a fiddle in the band. I think yeah. that, I think that's yeah. Alabama. So Rochi's singing the fiddling. He's talking about the fiddling. It's the end of the night, right? And he's like, the fiddling ain't done, Podsy. The fiddling ain't done. He's telling me <laughs> in the bar. And anyways, we end up we end up leaving the bar. We're going back to the hotel. And Rochi's swaying down the street. And, you know, I mean, all is good. We, we've given him our hugs and stuff. And, and I'm asking him what his, what his room number is. And he keeps, you know, 423, 423. I'm like, Rochi, your shirt's 423. It's like 330 in the morning, right? Or four or something. Like St. John yeah. doesn't even ever close down. Yeah, 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 423. And he's still talking about the fiddling. And so I knock on 423. <laughs> this is a huge hotel. Remember that one? Like you had the, yeah, yeah. the overpass and walk. I mean, I don't know yeah, how many like floors the, yeah. there were there. It's huge. Yeah. The room he told me was Steve Sterling's room. So I Steve Sterling, our head coach, comes to the door I didn't even know he had fake teeth. He's got no teeth in. <laughs> his hair is like this high. He looks like Einstein. He's got his tidy whities on. It, I don't know who was more shocked, me to see me to see Sterles or Sterles to see me. Meanwhile, Rochi's in the hallway leaning against it. Like he's like holding the hotel up. The fiddling ain't done. Oh, anyways, he uh, he got the last two numbers backwards and Sh- Schultz, which was upstairs. We had to go one more or something. But anyways, my gosh. I have to get St- uh, Sterles on the show to see if he ever remembers that. That was a classic, absolute classic. That Future NHL crew. head coach. That was a good crew we had that year. That <laughs> was a good crew. Yeah. Is that the way it goes though? Like. You know, we we came. Well, I guess we got swept in the final. But when we got to the final, that's a hell of a hard place to get to, as you Did know. We get, you, no, we went five games, didn't we? I thought we got swept. Did we go five? No. Yeah, we blew it in the first. We lost the first game at home in overtime. We were winning the first game at home. Uh, they scored with like under a minute left. Oh yeah, multi. Then we won I this. Think. Then we won the second game, and then yeah, we couldn't score in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. We lost okay. three in a row in Chicago. We went there and lost three in a row. And like overtime, like two of them, I think. Yeah. yeah. Like I, that was frustrating because I felt like we had the better team, but they were just, they were, yeah. yeah, opportunistic for sure. Yeah. And they had a bunch of old guys that had been there before and done it. Yeah. And, you know, it was yeah. kind of our first kick in the can. But, um, but I always found the success of teams was like the guys that gave a shit about each other off the ice, yeah. you know, and the guys, I mean, we had a ton of fun. Of course we did things that probably, you know, guys aren't, we, we went out probably a little too much, but like when you do that. Well, when we went out, everyone went out. Yeah, you know exactly. What I mean? It was yeah. like the young guys, the old guys, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah everyone was together sure. and you're building yeah. those bonds and yeah. you're building that care and yeah. you want to compete for each other. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that's, that's a big thing. And that's a, uh, that's one of the things that I hearing about the modern day age and like, my God, these guys in COVID now and what they're having to do. And like, it doesn't sound like much of a, an existence, you know, yeah. right, right now. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and they're missing that time, not even in this year, but just in, in years previous, I heard that it's, you know, a lot of room service guys don't even go out to eat in the road yeah. anymore. You know, guys bring their yeah. playstations and stuff. And it's just like, I can't imagine that environment of how that's conducive to, you know, doing what we just talked about, you know, building those relationships and that care factor and that family. And I think you see in the playoffs, the teams that do care about each other are the ones that go the furthest. It seems, you know what I mean? It looks mm-hmm. like they're playing for each other more. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, look at like what St. Louis was a prime example. No, like they were almost what dead last in the league at one point, And then they kind of turned it around and it's like, they just battled for each other. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and you mentioned too, even about the physicality side. They had a big, heavy team. They started to play hard. They're harder to play against in the playoffs than they yeah. were in the regular season. And yeah, um, yeah, good things happen. And then Tampa just has that mix of everything. Like they're just yeah. super talented. Yeah, they can still hit you and play physical. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I mean, those types of players. I think, and I don't even mean like the Tom Wilsons because I think he's the far end of the spectrum. Like yeah. as far as meaning, yeah. you mean he's so physical and he's so heavy. Um, but the guys that can play mean, right, and the guys that can compete, like physically compete for pucks, and I don't necessarily mean fighting. I just mean being an ass to play against. Like that's – there's not as many grind, of those You guys. can grind a team, right? Like yeah. you can just grind a team now. Like everything's down low on the walls, and that's yeah, hard. Not that well, it's for can, free. 
Yeah, you can name those guys, right? Like, I mean, like the Tachuks, for instance. I mean, they play hard and gritty, but there was like yeah. a lot of guys like that in the 90s when yeah. we played. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of guys. Like, now there's yeah. like only a few and they stand out like a sore thumb and there's going to be more of them. Yeah. I mean, if you can play like that, I mean, teams want you. You can't have enough of those guys. But anyways, I digress. So so you you play out your first contract with the Islanders and that was the end of our, like that, that year we went to the final was your contract. Actually, that was my right? second contract. I was a restricted free agent. I had signed a two-year deal, then a one-year deal. Oh, with with the yeah. Islanders. So, so the Bridgeport deal with that year was a one year deal. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So they did like you a little bit, I guess. Well, to no, you. they they had my rights, so they oh. offered me like uh, the league minimum minimum, yeah. minimum in the minors, minimum in the yeah. Yeah, whatever they had to give you to retain your rights, yeah. the ten percent increase yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a kick in the junk. Um, so, but the next year, how did that contract go with the next year? Because you had a good year that year, and so Anna, Anaheim came knocking. Was uh, yeah? Did you like that deal? Was that was that one of I think I one had a of one, teams. or was that a few? Uh, uh, I had a couple teams interested, I guess, just because we went so far in the playoffs and uh, whatever else, and seemed like there was a good opportunity. Um, Chuck Fletcher was with Anaheim, and he was with Florida previously, and I was close to signing with Florida coming out of college so it seemed like a good fit that you know he was still interested in whatever else and um yeah so took the chance and signed there and and made the team out of camp did you not um no not technically i don't think uh had a really good i went to like rookie camp there did really well and then ended up kind of just building off that having a good main camp i think i kind of stayed around longer than they probably expected uh and then they had some young guys so they told me that you know they were going to send me down but because they had to figure out number stuff for a few games and yeah i mean i went down for i don't know what it was eight ten games and then they called me right back up and yeah, what a year gave me enough. it was yeah it was good but i mean it was it was a good organization to be a part of actually yeah I mean, the older guys were good to me. Uh, yeah, I remember like guys like Steve Ruch and just even during camp, like I never met him before, didn't know anything. And you know how it is. It's like when you're a young group there and then there's like the, the team group, right? And, you know, you don't really segregate that much. But I remember him coming up one time and just saying like, hey, keep going. Like uh, you're doing well and, you know, people are noticing. And you know, I kind of was just kind of going about my business, but he made a point to come and say something, which was nice. And, yeah, I found that that was that was nice. There's something I didn't get, I guess, you know, with the Islanders yeah. organization. Yeah. yeah, yeah, isn't that wild? Um, I just love that because I mean, here we were talking about what we don't remember, what we can't remember, but you remember somebody taking the time to say five sentences to you, you know, in in that in yeah. that camp, and and that's super memorable, and that <laughs> made an impression, and that made you feel like you belonged and you fit in, like. Um, God, there's something to be said with that. I mean, we, we have we have the power to influence, especially when we're in a situation like as veterans or, you know, as leaders to help, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Yeah. It's, no, I definitely, um, the good what? leaders, I mean, for sure, you know, they realize that. What was it like with um, Paul? Because I, I know that you, well, I don't know if you've listened to the interview, but you played with Kevin Sawyer, one of my ex-teammates there in, in yeah. Spokane, and I had him on early when I just started getting the podcast going. Awesome, awesome guests, great stories. Um, but he told a pretty funny one about Paul Correa. Like, what was your what was your association with Paul, and how was, how was he? Because you wore the C that year, I believe, right? Yeah. I mean, Soyzy is just the salt of the earth, right? So, yeah. And actually, we hung out quite a bit, too, in uh, – in Anaheim, but I ended up once I got settled there, I ended up sitting right beside Paul in the locker room. So he was right beside me and you know, he's like a superstar legend, like, you know, I'm this schmelt there. Uh so I kind of <laughs> kept to myself and whatever, but he was super nice, like honestly, so such a good down to earth guy and you know, so passionate about the game and a great leader. Like I honestly thought he was a good leader. He wasn't super vocal, but he knew when to speak up and when he spoke up people listened uh i mean as far as him like i remember him being a big part of our season turning around i feel like the the first year uh we were kind of you know babcock was a new coach they made some changes as far as guys coming in and out like you know guys that have been there for a few years 
you know, kind of got traded and stuff like that. And they were kind of figuring stuff out. And, you know, we'd win a couple games, lose a couple games, win a couple games, lose a couple, play good against a good team, bad against a bad team. And, you know, there got to be a point, a tipping point. I can't remember what, when it was, like November, December, maybe it was December, something like that. And I remember we had a closed door meeting and he kind of was like, he would never, he never spoke up that much. He kind of just came as like, listen, you know what, it's time that, you know, we got on board here and bought into, you know, what our coaches want us to do. And, you know, he basically said that he was going to do it and that everyone should do it and, and whatever else, let's put everything aside and just go for it, like whatever. And from that point on, I felt like the team really came together and uh, we kind of found an identity, you know, that year of, you know, we were pretty solid defensively, didn't, didn't give up much, great goaltending. And then, you know, pretty good power play and stuff like that. And we kind of rode that through the second half of the season. And then, you know, our confidence built and then going into the playoffs. Yeah. We ended up, I think we were the eight seed playing Detroit the first round and yeah. Got all the way to the final. Yeah. yeah that's um. so you're sitting beside Paul Korea. Like you have the Hobie Baker in common at that point. Like did, uh, you know, which is rare. How many guys win the Hobie Baker and you're sitting beside each other, both with the university background, both from the BCJHL. Um, did you feel some familiarity with that or did he recognize that familiarity? Yeah, he was, su- he was super nice. Like I, I, I played against Steve quite a bit in college too, right? Uh, his brother. And so, I mean, we're both from BC and that. So yeah, I mean, we always chatted and stuff like that. Right. Not a ton. I mean, he's a pretty quiet guy in a sense at times too, but yeah, he well, was real good focused, and, right? Like talk about yeah, his Yeah, like uh, methodical, I would say. Yeah. Like, you know what? first I was like what's going on here like you know then I kind of figure it out like he just had a routine like you know he needed to check off the boxes to make himself ready and whether that was you know when he got to the rink he would be loose to a certain point and then you know he started his routine you know whether it was warm-up stretching uh you know getting his stick ready getting whatever and like his gear had to be like just how he wanted it you know his socks had to fit a certain way his stick had to be a certain height his flex and you know it you know, I'm saying I think really doesn't make that much difference. But for him, you know, once everything was right and he'd done everything, then he could just go on and play. And, you know, and, you know, he's super consistent. And obviously that was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, had a few people talk about him before. As, and not every everyone's a different personality. You know that as well as I do. You I mean, yeah. not everybody can prepare the way Paul Korea did. It wouldn't be right for them. They, they'd be, you know, yeah. they, they yeah. couldn't be able to play. But he he kind of fits that prototypical, like, pro hockey player yeah. right like he's like he's he seems like he's like there's all there's a purpose for everything you know what i mean yeah. like he's, he's on he's before. on the extreme probably of being a pro like i don't think most people couldn't function that way i think but right. he found a way to do it and that's what made him so good like he dedicated yeah everything into making himself the best and his mental work has been lauded by many, like as far as what he did visualization and how he yeah. would use that as part of his pregame prep. Was that anything you ever dug in with him about or asked him about or noticed? No, I don't think I was that comfortable to kind of dig in too much, you know? All like, right. uh, yeah. I'd love to have him on actually. I, Cause I played with him in Penticton too, uh, when he yeah. was in BCJ. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and he's always been friendly with me when I've seen him in the airports yeah. or whatever, but uh, yeah. I'd love to have him on. I think he'd be a great guest to, to yeah, chat about sure. that side of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and you had Babs too. That's so wild. So you had Babs. I had Babs in Spokane for two years. Mm-hmm. And what an interesting story about Korea. So like maybe, I don't know, I'm just maybe, you know, so Babs probably came in. He was pretty hard driving like he usually was. I mean, he was, uh, that was his first NHL job at that point, yeah. I believe. Right. So I'm sure he's trying to make a name for himself. And uh and he must, maybe, I, I'm thinking that he talked to Paul, right? He knew if he didn't get to Paul, like, he's not going to have the team, right? So Paul needs to Paul needs to buy even, in. I don't even know if he talked to Paul. I feel like just Paul was smart enough to realize that, you know, Babs was probably the first of, would you say, a new style of coaching? You know what I mean? Like, ultra-prepared, like, intense. Like, the practices were super intense, as I'm sure you knew. Like, it was... Mm-hmm you almost had to be more prepared than a game for practice, but they were quick, they were fast. And when you were done, you're like, okay. Like I found we practiced so hard that games, you almost had more time in games because you were doing stuff, which was good. And then like the preparation as far as scouting report on every player on the team, on the other team, like their systems, you know, 
all this stuff and then what we were going to do and then all that stuff. So it was, a, it was a lot probably for, you know, some guys to handle it instead of just like, Hey, here's the lineup. Here's what our breakout is. Here's who's on the power play and whatever else, you know, it's, yeah. so I felt like there was, yeah, part of the group was probably like, Oh my God, this guy's over the top and whatever else. And I think Paul realized that and he's got to a point where he wanted to win. He's like, Hey, we need to give this, a shot like a legitimate shot we need to buy in here yeah yeah that's wild yeah that's probably a good point i bet you that was what because i mean it was a. you're always divided like you say i mean you have that you have that core group that's been there a certain way they've they've had a certain experience you know that they've been used to there's younger guys and there's also those guys that are established and aren't maybe as keen to please right whereas you you're obviously he's going to say jump and you're going to say how high there might not be other guys saying that uh, but you have Paul Curry at the at the uh, you know in the room there saying, "Hey, let's get on board here." That uh, good for Paul. I mean, regardless of how that yeah. happened, because that obviously helped Mike establish himself, you know, yeah. as a coach going to the final yeah. that first year, and obviously, it, it, I mean, it helped all you guys uh, get into a Stanley Cup Finals. Pretty wild. What do you? What are your memories from that uh, from that whole run? It was just a blur, really. I mean, uh, I found that we believe though like if, if, as dumb as that sounds like going into the playoffs like the way we played over the previous three four months you know we'd beat a lot of the top teams and you know i just felt like we, everyone was so comfortable with their role and their system and our system that uh we knew it'd be hard to beat and then you know i think detroit was almost a good matchup they were you know older squad that you know maybe played a little bit looser um and yeah i mean we were kind of in your face you know high intensity uh not give anything up and i think that frustrated them a little bit and you know maybe we had some puck luck i mean jagger played unbelievable but uh yeah we never kind of gave him a chance to get going who are your alignments uh, it was always change you know babs he was always changing the line i mean, played with sammy paulson sometimes cheese stop dan balzema rob niedemeyer uh i think mark Schwenard. I can't even remember. Yeah. It, you know, you're always, I was kind of a utility guy too. Like, uh, took a lot of face offs, did some penalty killing, you know, slot in third, fourth line. Um, well, good for you though. Yeah. You played every game, right? You know, like, no, it was uh, good. Yeah. I mean, I had to change my game a lot that year, honestly, like play a bottom six role in order to make it. And, you know, I think it helped me become a more rounded player, you know, just seeing the game from a different side, you know, it wasn't about, calculating risk to to get scoring opportunities is about you know playing a sound game you know making sure the puck got out making sure it got in you know wearing out the other team's defense and you know uh a scoring chance or a goal was a bonus it was like don't give anything up right Mm -hmm. yeah was that communicated to you or was that just you knew that that was what you the way you had to do it Uh, no it was communicated i would say it was throughout the year communicated whether it was babs or Paul McLean or uh, Lauren Henning, like, you know, they were just like, Hey, you don't need to score. Like you're not here to, to create stuff. It's like, we need you to be safe and whatever. And I think face-offs were a huge thing that gave me an opportunity. I ended up, you know, doing pretty well there. And, you know, you know, Babs was, he trusted, trusted guys a lot and was big on that. Like he was the first coach that, it, you know, focused so much energy on face-offs and, you know, looking at it now, it's like, you know, winning a face-off can be the difference of, you know, having the puck for 30 seconds, your whole shift, they're chasing it. And, uh, yeah, I ended up, you know, being decent on that, and that kind of got me extra ice time. Yeah, a great way to earn a coach's trust, eh? Win a few draws. Yeah, although every time you're going out, end of the game, it's like, do not do not lose this draw. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so wild, too. I, I was digging into, actually, those stats a little bit. You mean – it's crazy to be the best in the league. You're like you're high fifties. Yeah. You know, like about that's... 60, 60 percent back then, I think was about, you know, I think it was Yannick pro and I think Arnott was really good on draws too. Yeah. yeah but I mean, that's, you win six, I mean, lose four. I mean, yeah. like that's, that's just yeah. crazy. Like yeah. that, that, there's such yeah. a fine line there, right. Between yeah. one of the best, you say, don't lose it, but I mean, the best guy in the league loses four out of every 10, right? Like it's, it's a tough thing to master, but, uh, um, yeah, a lot of guys have put a lot of time into that. though as a skill set because you, if you do get good at them, and if you're over fifty percent, I mean, you're a, you're a massive advantage to whoever whoever you're with. 
Yeah, and even on the offensive side, what I found later in my career, like the amount of scoring chances you can get from, you know, being able to win draws, whether it was, you know, in the AHL or even overseas, like, you know, setting up plays, like it's it was great. Yeah. 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 Did you, um, the, that was your first full time stint uh, in the show. I mean, you'd had some samples before your cups of coffee, yeah. kind of similar to me. Uh, but now you're on the team, you're in the playoff run. Was there any point in that season where you, kind of felt like, yeah, I'm one of them. I belong. I'm an NHLer. Or were you, uh, or did you get there? I guess there, there's a sense of relief when they tell you uh, to get a place. Like I was in the hotel, obviously a training camp, then Cincinnati, then came back. I was probably in the hotel for another month and a half after that. And I remember, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Babs or when we came back on the bus one time when we got back from a trip. It's like, hey, you can go get a place. So that's obviously a sense of relief. But I, you know, being, you know, in the NHL, you know how it is. It's like stuff happens so quick. So I don't think I ever was completely comfortable. That's maybe me though, too, right? You know that everyone else is, there's always guys, healthy scratches that are trying to get in the lineup and whatever else. And so stuff can change quickly. Yeah, and maybe that was a bad thing that I, you know, in a sense, part of it's good because it keeps you motivated in that. But at the same time, maybe you're playing a little bit nervous and, you know, not quite, you know, reaching your full potential too. Yeah, I always have a big smile on my face when I hear guys say that. Those are the words that I never heard. But, like, I can imagine how cool that would have been, right? Yeah. Like, and, and what is the process? Like, I, I, it sounds stupid. Like, what is the process? Like, how long do you have to be there for? And what conversation happens at the top where they're like, okay, now he can go get a place? You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, what? I don't know. Do yeah. you know what I mean? I, like, like, honestly, I was just – we were on the bus. So we, like, flown back from somewhere. We were on the bus and just about back at the rink. And yeah, he just came back and said, Hey, you can go get a place. I was like, Okay, sweet. Okay. Like, yeah. it wasn't like you had a hat yeah. the night before, or it wasn't like, you no. know what I mean? Like, yeah, no. it's just like yeah. another day, yeah. right? And it's like, yeah. Okay, now I can go get a place. That's cool. Oh, that's so fun, man. And then, yeah, the Stanley Cup final run. What was, um, what happened in the final there with the, with the Devils? I forgot what that series went to. It was the Devils, correct? Seven. Yeah, seven. It went to, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's the one won, that, Jaguar won the con. Yeah, Smythe that's the one losing. where Korea got knocked out and they came back and scored. In game six. In game six. Holy yeah. smokes. What was that like as far as from a team standpoint of knowing that that happened and he came back and all that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, he got hit and you're like, okay, he's done. And then, yeah, it was almost like surreal when he came back on the bench. And then the fact to go on the ice and score like whatever it was next shift or next couple shifts. It's like, yeah. The roof almost came off the building, I think. Oh, my gosh. You don't yeah, even man. believe it, right? But then at the same time, you're like, okay, it's Paul Korea. He can do that. Yeah. So there's part of you that's like, yeah, I don't believe it. But then it's like, if anyone can do it, he could do it. You're working with players now as part part of, uh, you know, your, your after after player life. Um, so you're seeing what type of talent is, is on the ice now and what type of game it is. Is Paul one of those guys you think would be – better now like or like how do you think he'd fit in today's style of game uh i mean he's a hall of famer so i don't know if he'd be better yeah but you'd think so just with the style of the game having i mean you played the clutch and grab and you know remember trying to stand in front of the net yeah. you're like you're Good getting cross checked in the back or you know if he went in the corner you know you were getting pinned against the wall or whatever else so i'm sure you know, he would probably be better off, you know, just the physical, the physicality of it now is probably less in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would think, I mean, it's pretty impressive how well he did in that style of game, you know, it's amazing. Uh, Cause he's not yeah, big. It's amazing. You know, that's no. why I bring that up is because like he was, I mean, Pavel Bure was fast and there was guys, there's obviously guys that were, you I mean, supremely quick, but he was the quickest in my mind of like our era. Like as far as like yeah. left to right, his agility was, was second to none. He was not a big body. Um, so he wasn't like a Jagger that you got to stick on him. He he'd pull three guys with him. I mean, Paul didn't play like that. Right. Yeah. But like now in today's day and age with how, how quick he was and how agile he was without anyone allowed to put a stick on you. I could not imagine how he, yeah. anyone would get the fuck off. And then the way he thought the game too, right. It's like one yeah. thing to be quick, but like when he's thinking ahead of other people too, it's, I mean, that's why he survived probably as long as he did as well. 
Yeah, yeah, he had the quickness, but it's like he was reading the game two or three steps ahead of everyone else. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, he'd be fun to watch in some of these different areas. It's nice to be able to transplant guys. I'd love to play that game uh, in and out. Yeah. Uh, so what happened with the lockout? That's one thing I wanted to get into. I know we're, we're, com- we're going to come up here in an hour and a half, so I don't want to take up all, all of your entire evening. But we had the lockout years. So everybody had to go somewhere. I know you had another season in 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 uh, Anaheim after that. So you mean you got to the Cup final? You went no, to yeah. So yeah, Cup final, and then I played another year, and then Lockout came. Then the Lockout came. Yeah, um, I was gonna sign a deal. I was in talk to like sign a deal, and then obviously the Lockout came, so everything kind of got halted. Yeah. Um, then yeah, the Lockout became a reality. Uh, ended up going overseas to to be like Austria and playing on one of those deals where you had an out clause. So went and played overseas and ended up, yeah, the lockout went the whole year. And then after that, uh, things had changed, obviously in Anaheim. Um, Babcock went to Detroit. I think Brian Murray went to Ottawa, I believe. Um, I didn't have any one ways after that. And so I ended up, I was training with Steve Connor Walchuk actually in Fernie and uh, he floated the idea of coming to Colorado for a tryout. So I went to Colorado for a tryout. Um, they, I did training camp, did decent. They offered me a contract, but it wasn't a one way. And I just, I don't know, maybe it was a mistake. I didn't want to bounce up and down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I ended up having a lot of, from being in Europe and doing well, I had some decent opportunities over there. So I decided to go over to Switzerland and play for a year. Uh, How was that on like mentally? I mean, you, I would assume you felt like you'd establish yourself and proven yourself at the NHL level, and now you you couldn't get a one way deal. Was that uh, tough pill to swallow? Or yes and no, but I mean, at that point, I'd been through so much. You know, it's kind of like uh, I just wanted to go and play somewhere, and so I was okay with it. And I enjoyed Europe a lot; like it was fun. And I guess maybe it was just from spending so much time my first few years in a hotel and just like no home and whatever else. I just didn't think I wanted to do that at that point. Like I was got, I was close to 30 probably by then or 28, 29, I would think. Um, so yeah, that was kind of played into it. And then, yeah, so I went over. Went over and did the Europe thing. I mean, that's when I, I left after Bridgeport when we played with you. And I yeah. kind of, that was, for me, it was like, well, I had I had a two way offer. The Islanders assigned me to a one year deal there, right at that point. And I had uh, I forget there were some offers two ways again. And I was like, you know what? Like that was when I was like, I don't think I'm very good anymore. Like I kind of like <laughs> felt like that, right? And I'm like, I got to yeah. go and be a goal scorer again and get back to whatever it is that I think yeah. that I am is my DNA. And so my idea was, yeah, let's go to let's go to Germany. Hopefully, have a good year and then come back, right? Like that yeah. was that was my plan, one year. And then, it, like you said, I had so much fun, like, and I enjoyed yeah. the game again, you know, and, yeah. and I had a home and I didn't have to worry about being traded. And like, there was all these things that were going yeah. on, plus the extension and the money was good. And it's like, it was that big moment of like, man, like, am I, is the NHL dream kind of done? Like, is this, is this yeah. it? And yeah, I ended up staying, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, who knows if that's right or wrong. I mean, I definitely enjoyed my time there. Um, you know, I didn't yeah. play another game in the NHL. So, I mean, that that prophecy <laughs> turned out to be true. You know, <laughs> signing the deal wasn't conducive to an NHL career. But um, I see where you're coming from with that. That was all I guess I say is, you know, like once you're there and you've experienced it, it's like, well, yeah, why ride the bus through Springfield and Lowell? And, you know, I can be in the Swiss Alps and like making really good money. Yeah, and, like, like experiencing games, the world. 80 games in the... AHL versus yeah playing like 40 or whatever it was 50 over there yeah mm. yeah it's a different different ball of wax uh did you have a family at the time uh no no, no. so yeah so I mean, that makes it easier too right you can kind of go that's yeah. the same thing with me right I could go and I wasn't responsible to anybody or anything and yeah. other than myself and it was easy to go and experience some stuff you end up coming back though so you obviously had the yep. itch um yeah I had know, a good still. year I had a pretty good year ended up actually getting uh I guess traded or bought by a Swedish team and went and played in Sweden. And we went all the way to the finals and ended up having a decent, uh, some decent contract offers, I guess the following year, uh, I guess actually, I guess circle back to Bridgeport when we played Chicago, um, I guess made an impression there and, uh, they'd made a few 
um, I guess inquiries about me over my career and yeah, they were kind of came at me pretty hard in the summer. So I ended up signing a deal with Atlanta slash Chicago. Yeah. And I mean, you had a career, I mean that, I mean, not that first year, but yeah, again, up and down. Like, so what was the, like, what was happening? So they, they, they make a pitch for you. They obviously want you Atlanta. Do you think it was like, was it an Atlanta that wanted you or Chicago? Like they have a year mark to help in the minors as depth or where do you think that fit? I would say it was mostly a Chicago thing with yeah. A depth guy. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back. I mean, maybe I was a little bit naive thinking that, you know, I had a better chance than it was, but it probably was more, yeah, Chicago wanted me more than Atlanta. Right. The uh, Talk about the Wolves, man, because that one year, 07, 08, you won everything there was to win. Um, you guys yeah, won it even all. The year, even the year before that, um, I mean, just talk about an organization that, you know, wanted to win and would do everything possible as far as, you know, taking care of all the little things, you know, taking care of the players and putting – the best players on the ice that they could and, and everything like that. So it was, you know, a great Chicago is a great city too, like a fun place to live. And uh, yeah, it was actually, I think our team the first year maybe was even better than the second year that we won, but we ran into Carey Price uh, and Hamilton in the conference finals. Um, and I know we peppered like 50 shots on him every game and we couldn't, he was couldn't there, right? uh, get by him. Yeah. And that was, it might've been his rookie year too. Right. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, just a great owner, great. I mean, Shevel Dayoff was a GM there, mm -hmm. uh, Winnipeg's GM. And then, you know, just top to bottom, just talk about an organization that kind of worked together, communicated, and just had a common goal in mind. Uh, right. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. yeah, and like you said, you can't have personal success without team success, or very rarely. And I mean, that that next year, you you led the IHL in points. You won the most outstanding player. You end up winning the MVP of the playoffs. You guys win the the, the whole nine yards. Like, is that? I mean, now you've had like two years in your hockey career, maybe more. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like where things really went right, you know, like, do, do you feel like that was the top of your game that 07, 08 year? Was that the best Jason Krog could play? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, winning is obviously an amazing thing. So, you know, it's memorable. Um, but you know how, I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes you get luck. Sometimes you get bounces. Like, you know, I might even been playing better. I can give you a look at my points per game the year before, I think it was. It's like we had a super high scoring team that year. Mm -hmm. Like it was, you know, ridiculous. 44 games. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's and heavy. I mean, our my line mates, like I'd hate our had like broke the record with like, I can't remember, 30 something games with a point. And, you know, Sterling was a rookie. He got like a ridiculous amount. Like, you know, even if you look down that lineup too, like we had guys sitting out that were like a point a game. Uh, so was it the best? It's hard to say. I don't know. Right. I, I was fortunate to have a bunch of good years and I guess the best years are the ones you win. Right. So, yeah. I'm just wondering that too, though, just from, you know, people and, and the, and the whole life cycle of being an NHL or, or when that fits in yeah. or how that happens, you know, because our evolution as players happen at different times, you know, like Tim Thomas won the Vesna at 30 and he wasn't even in the league till he was 28. Yeah. I mean, where was he yeah. until 28? You know I mean, was he no yeah. good or was he just getting better? Yeah. Like was Jason Krog getting better, I guess is what I mean. Like, and it's, should have that have been your time where you're getting an opportunity, do you think? Or like, how, how did that fit into that whole NHL um, career possibility? Again, I think, you know, like we talked about before, I, it took me time to figure out, you know, the league. And at that point, I feel like I understood the AHL. Well, uh, I was super comfortable with the organization and great players around me, you know, coaches that knew me as a player and kind of put me in a position to flourish. And so everything was good. Uh, you know, is that, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it just, every, everything aligned, I guess. Right. Yeah. The perfect storm, eh? When it comes together, it's just, but uh, yeah. Right. So to say, like, if I went to the NHL, I don't know, maybe I had some shots in the NHL that year and, you know, it was put in a different role. And I think Hartley was the coach and, you know, I wasn't a Hartley kind of player and I could see that and I could feel that. Uh, and, you know, maybe I should have changed my game when I got up there, but, you know, stubborn, whatever else. Uh, 
you know, I'd, I'd be on the half fall or whatever, playing power play down low, down in the minors. And I go up there and, you know, you're playing whatever, a third, fourth line role and then playing in front of the net on the power play. And, you know, I should have taken the opportunity and ran with it instead. I'm like, why am I standing in front of the net here? I don't even know how to, you know, you know what I mean? But it's like, you like put your guard up instead of just being like, you know, I should be grateful that I'm getting an opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah. And just like take the cross checks and stand in front and hopefully one goes off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I just, uh, I just texted a, cl- a client today, actually. Uh, my words of wisdom were, you don't have to like it, but you need to accept it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And m- meaning like when totally. we're in that resistance mode, right? Like when we're sitting there and like you're in front of the net going, why the hell am I here? Right. Like that is yeah. th- your yeah. focus is where in the wrong spot, right? Your, yeah. your, your energy is going somewhere else. So you don't have to like it. I think that's part of us being competitive athletes too. It's like, I, I shouldn't be on the fourth line. Like I need to let yeah. people know that I'm not supposed to be here yet. That entire focus and that train of thought is like not helping you. Right. So like, and that's where you get caught in that. Yeah. In that well, I was going to grab my charger for my computer here quick. Yeah. No worries. Gonna Sorry. Hey, man, no worries. Cause I found myself in that resistance, you know, lots of times. You know, like, yeah. why why am I leading the league in goals? And why am I here? And why haven't I only got three yeah. games? And, you know, I mean, like, all that stuff is like, it. when you're in the moment, it's hard, right? And I think uh, it's easy to get there. But I do think, and maybe you were too, that I, I could have wrapped my head around gratitude in a different way. And I think of acceptance yeah. in a different way with a little bit of support, a little bit of talk, you know, like someone else other than me talking to me all the time, you know, like... Did yeah. you feel you could have maybe used used a I don't know a little bit of support somewhere down the line th- throughout the years? For sure, yeah, for sure, yeah. And I think that the leagues change now, and the games change, and you know the communication is like completely different now. Uh, you know, with the coaches, even like you know in the minor hockey level, I think all the way up to the pro level, like you know, I think the mental side of the game and you know giving kids the tools to succeed is is uh is much more prevalent i guess uh like i said even like talking about that fourth line role and you know one way to look at it why am i playing there but then you know what you're playing against the other team's fourth line players so maybe you're going to get more opportunity like you know what i mean there's different ways to spin it which yeah i wish i would have in hindsight yeah. looked at it that way yeah any um uh, reflection after you know however many teams you played and however long you did you know, i mean goodness gracious um well into your late thirties, like what, what advice would you have now? If there is one piece you could take away uh, to be, to be an adaptable guy who has a, who can have a long career. Yeah. I think just never get complacent, you know, always, like you said, always put your ego aside and like, you know, let, try and learn from things, you know, you can learn from your teammates, you can learn from your coaches and, you know, it's, you have to trust, I think, uh, to a certain point in order to, to take things on. And maybe, you know what, maybe you don't agree with everything, but uh, you know, I think you need to trust in order to grow and, and whatever else. Do you find there's a line there between the uh, like being, I don't know, having the humility to be humble and like to learn and not be complacent yet not having the swag or to like, you know, dive yeah. forward and to maybe yeah. take the chances that you need to take. Yeah, there is for sure. It's it's hard to find that balance, I think, because, yeah, you can't be afraid to fail and, and whatever else. And at the same time, yeah, you know how it is when you have confidence, like things come easier and, you know, you, you, you don't think about stuff. You just go and do them and it happens. So, yeah, that's like the secret recipe, eh? like that, that nice little balance there between <laughs> not thinking you got it all figured out, yet still having the self-confidence and the belief to know that. Yeah, always you know, wanting to get better right like you you see the best players and it's like they're never complacent like as good as they are it's like they're still trying to get better and you know maybe it's not their own game maybe it's bringing up you know motivating their team or you know sharing stuff or whatever it is yeah yeah uh, ryan johnson my first pro roommate he he was a 
amazing guest here and uh really good dude and and one of one of his i know rj well yeah do you know rj well from from where um goes way back to college my roommate christian bragnello is one of his best friends from thunder bay so rj used to come on visit and then uh we were yeah we're all our groups been at weddings together and then he was oh, out in vancouver here when i was with vancouver in manitoba too Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, great guy. Um, yeah, it was awesome to reconnect with him. And, and one of the things, and he was like the consummate professional, like throughout his career, you yeah. know, as far as like how he approached the game and real methodical about, you know, what, what he could do and what service he was providing for the organization he was with. And, and when he talked about, he just mentioned being a teammate and he just said, I mean, everyone's going to have ups and downs, but one of the things he tried to focus on when he was in a slump was like, instead of looking inside himself, he would look outside and see who else was maybe struggling and try and like yeah. provide some positivity or try and bring each other up together. And um, I mean, wow, look at like, there's so much wisdom in that, but that's such a not yeah. a natural thing to do, you know? No, like I feel like if things are going well for yourself, it's easy to do that. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? If things are going well, it's like you see someone struggling in your team, then I think it's easy to do that. But when you're struggling, I feel like that's, yeah, that takes a lot. So that's, that's the last thing. That's I mean, the last that's why he did so well though. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. Yeah. Um, as far as what you're doing now, man, anything you want to, you know, I, I, I know you're working with some teams or a bit or some players. Do you want to, do you want to tell us a little bit what you're doing now? Uh, I mean, I'm coaching at an academy out here in Vancouver at BWC and uh, do some, development with you know anywhere young kids all the way up to you know guys in college and whl on the pro level um, and bwc that's burnaby winter club for you guys burnaby uh, winter club yeah. yeah and what what level is the team what age group uh bantam varsity uh 2007s mostly 2006 awesome. are you enjoying that yeah it's great uh i feel like i want to give back to the game um so i don't know how long i'm going to do it for but I get enjoyment out of teaching. Uh, you know, the coaching aspect is great, but I, I really like the teaching part and, you know, seeing kids, helping kids get better, I guess, you know, seeing deficiencies and, you know, maybe giving them a tip and then watching them, you know, gain confidence through that. So it's, it's fun. And, you know, I've had a great team this year to work with and last year, a great team too. So it's, it's fun being around motivated kids that want to get better and, and, and whatever else. What's the hardest thing to teach? The hardest thing to teach, probably, you know, the skill stuff's one thing, but, you know, reading and reacting the game, I think, uh, you know, sometimes that gets lost with, with all this stuff going on now. It's such a focus on skills, you know, and you, you can have all the skills in the world, but once, you know, things start, you get into a game and you got to process this, where's what's happening here you know, on the defensive offensive side or where's the puck going next or where should I be? Yeah. I feel like that's uh, a part of the game. That's the hardest to teach now. And some kids just naturally, you know, have it, uh, you know, and going back to trust, I think the more kids trust and use the players around them, they'll get better. Right. Cause you know, as you get older, you have to use the players around you. Like uh, I find a lot of the young kids, you know, you can get away with going coast to coast or, you know what I mean? Grabbing the puck and taking it and, you know, but once you get, you know, up to juniors and whatever else, it's like, you're only as good as your line mates, your teammates and, and, you know, they'll make you better, you know? So yeah. you gotta find those. Yeah. I noticed that too. Uh, I think without question, uh, like my, my 11 year old has a higher skill bandwidth of what he's capable to do with a puck than I did at 11, you yeah. know? And I, and I think that's uh, across the board. I think I can see that um, yeah. just because there's been such a focus on it. I mean, they've been yeah. developing, they see YouTube, yeah. they're doing these things that we never even dreamed of. So I do believe there's a higher, um, you know, there, there's a higher threshold there right now, but I do think that there, the hole is the holes. If there's holes is, is that whole toolbox. You know, yeah. like you have the tools and yeah, there's some edges and yeah, there's toe drags and yeah, they can shoot, but it's like you put them into a game scenario and sometimes like that, the grasp of the game, right? How is this game played is, um, yeah. Processing yeah. it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the tricks. Yeah. Like you is can there, be the fastest skater or whatever else, but if you can't process the game, you, you play slow. Yeah. Is that, uh, you were, you know what I thought you were great at is is um being able to slow the game down. You know, like I thought when yeah. you were at your best, like 
the game might be happening fast, but you you were able to slow it down to a pace where you're able to find somebody or go to an open hole. Is that something one that you agree with, and two is that is that something that you feel you you could help teach somebody? Yeah, I definitely think that's something I had success with. With was and I, you know, I wasn't a guy that would go coast to coast or like a great one on one player. I would say, and maybe that was because, like I said, I was smaller. Um, in stature and I wouldn't say even being a small player I was the fastest either you know so I had to find ways almost to use my teammates more than others and so I would try to suck players to me to find the best option uh, that was out there so um, I mean I, I guess I try to help players but I think the game's changed a lot too like you know there's there's not as much time and space out there and you know everyone's more aware on the defensive side, I feel like now than they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago was a focus on going forward. And, you know, there was a lot more breakdowns, whereas there's way more systems now, the video and all this stuff. Like, I feel like if there's less mistakes, especially at the higher levels, right. I think you might agree too. like a lot of the goals now are on PowerPoint and stuff like that. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think like, yeah, I, I try to teach kids to, you know, not just move the puck to like, you know, try to draw someone to you, try to put the person you're moving the puck to in a better position than you are, I guess, or to have like, you know, I mean, just move the puck to the right times, right. Yeah. especially the power play. I find the young kids, you know, they're, they'll pass the puck around 10 times, but they're not really making the penalty kill do anything. And then they're having trouble finding stuff. Whereas if you just, you know, create one, two on one and isolate something and then, you know, you can get a good scoring opportunity. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, uh, I was just thinking like we played together a little, not so much in Lowell, but we did a little bit in Bridgefort. Um, yeah, for a while. I remember. Yeah. Um, with, with some su success, but I actually think like the way yeah. you and I played, we, sh we could have, or if we had played together longer, could have had more success. Cause you did like to slow it down. I like to play fast, right? So yeah. like that, that juxtaposition of, of how we'd like to play. And I was a shooter and you were a passer. We, we, uh, I think that could have been a fun, fun combo to. No, to I remember, I feel like I can remember a couple games and a couple goals you scored where, yeah, I was ahead of the play kind of pulled up at the line and I knew you'd be driving and kind of laid it out in the space and you would beat your guy and, and score or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Fun. I love playing like that. And when you find that chemistry, and that's something that's interesting too, right? Like that when you get that with somebody, um, yeah. that's just fun. Like it just makes yeah. the game so much easier. You're not when you don't have to like absolutely process where is he now, what's he gonna like you yeah. know what's happening, right? Yeah. You guys know know what the tendencies are. That makes the game so much fun. Um the one thing I don't agree with, though, which I, I'm, we're allowed to disagree, is that I, I watch and I, I don't think guys know how to play defense anymore. Like when I watch the when I watch in zone coverage, like as far as how like Brian Maxwell or Mike Babcock taught me how yeah. to play defense, like so much puck watching. Like I, there's a lot of contraction. I, I think like everyone. Yeah, likes that's to be what inside. I, I guess that's what I mean more is like no one takes chances. Like everyone's right. always back in around the house, so it's like you're always shooting through a crowd or like there's no free space i guess yeah, yeah not inside the hash marks i mean i've seen no. all five guys almost in the crease yeah. a few times yeah. you know and yeah. everyone's looking in, in the in the corner of the puck and i, I mean I, I pointed out sometimes from from my teams and i grabbed the the things i'm like you have to understand where at where other people are on the ice if you don't know yeah. you know I mean like how are you even defending because the yeah. guy in the corner is not going to score on you but anyways um and I, I i know dave oliver too and a couple other coaches in the league and and it is interesting because they're saying that yeah i mean whether whether again, there's so much emphasis on the skill and on the offense and on on that development that whether the defensive side is getting you know forgotten and there's not yeah. really the traditional roles of I'm supposed to keep the puck out of the net. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, I I don't know if that's if that's like what we're seeing or not. But anyways, man, we should go. I, I know. Um, I know I said I was going to keep you for no longer than ninety, and here we are. It always happens. So no we can keep going no too. Worries. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, what a great career, you know, 200 games, um, a lot of successes, so many teammates and so many places where we crossed yeah. lines without even knowing. Yeah. And I think for me being a suitcase, um, you know, looking back like that, that's really the blessing to be honest. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like maybe you don't have the solid, solid friendships of like playing with an organization for 10 years that obviously are irreplaceable, but to cross paths with so many quality people and so many different places is, uh, 
is something that you know no one can take away from either one of us and i know we met a lot of good players along the way so um, yeah there's a lot of good people in hockey for sure and that's yeah. you know like you said moving around it's like you you're in weird situations but it's like the the guys always make you feel welcome and there's so many good people yeah should we and now that i just talked and i had it highlighted here should we talk about the KHL? Because that might be a good story in there. You left after five games. Was it a nightmare or, or should we just leave oh, that one alone? Yeah. No, I got injured. It wasn't really oh, much. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got uh, broke a bone in my hand and then uh, they were cutting the budget. So I was part of the budget cutting. <laughs> There's so many good stories from that though. I've heard yeah. like Mike Watts told me. Like, There's this, it goes on and on. Somebody, anyone who's played in KHL has like, a KHL story. You know what I mean? It's oh, not like yeah. that, like that doesn't happen I mean, in Bridgeport, you know, or it doesn't yeah. happen in Atlanta. It's only happened yeah. in the KHL. <laughs> Classic. Anyways, man, once again, thanks so much. I love what you're doing. I love that you're, you're yeah, giving back it. too and, and, having, a, you and too. having a blast doing it. And yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll have to cross paths here on some type of, I don't know, something. Yeah, um, I'm sure either come down to the coast or I'll be down in the Okanagan at some point. But yeah, uh, that's a good excuse yeah. for a golf trip. We'll have a special, special guest coach, Jason Krog after we, yes. after we shoot 18 at Predator. Sounds good. I love it, buddy. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for being with us today um, for episode 61 of Up My Hockey with Hobie Baker winner, Jason Krog. Till next time. Cheers. Thank you again for being here today, uh, listening to the entire episode. And uh, Jason, if you're still listening, or if you did listen, much appreciated, man. Uh, love catching up. It's one of the things that I'm super grateful for with this podcast is to reconnect with some old faces, um, some old teammates, and some great friends. You know, hockey is such a crazy sport. We get traded and moved all over the place, and and solid long lasting um, friendships meaning that where you can stay in touch and keep in touch are rare but what isn't rare is the fact of getting somebody on the phone and you share a season and you share a final together and and uh, and you share some of these moments in your life that those will never be forgotten about and it was super nice to see Jason's face and to reminisce over some of the things that we shared throughout our career so uh, Croggy thanks so much and and just what a great story you know I, I do his personality uh, is what made him such a great teammate because he was easy to laugh at himself. He was easy to be the first guy um, to make fun of himself. He was really humble. He would always be there for you if you needed him. And that's how you play the game to be 39 years old. You know, plus he was a hell of a hockey player. I mean, that doesn't hurt either. But, uh, but Jason was able to be a great teammate. He was able to fit in and to be adaptable and to be flexible and to find different roles in different areas. And if he needed to be the man, he could be the man as his most outstanding player awards in the AHL and winning the most outstanding player in the playoffs the year they won the Turner Cup and to win the Hobie Baker Award as the best collegiate player on the planet um, are all testaments, obviously, that this guy could play the game. Uh, but what is even more of a testament to me in my mind is that when he wasn't called upon to be the guy, to be the guy on the half wall on the power play who was supposed to score the game-winning goal in overtime, um, at, at some of these levels he was at, he was able to contribute. He was able to develop his face-off skills. He was able to be able to finish his checks and create energy. And he's able to do things that allowed him to stay in the lineup and keep him desirable uh, to the age of 39. So lots of lessons to be learned from Jason um, and others. You know what I mean? Uh, I love what's going on here with the Up My Hockey podcast. Uh, there's so many good guests. If you're just joining us now and this was your first one, please go back and listen to some of these stories. There's so much knowledge and so much experience and so many takeaways that are going to help you uh, either as a player or as a coach or as a parent um, to help dreams come true. And really that's what this, uh, at the end of the day, is the inspiration of this podcast, to help dreams come true. So till next time, play hard and keep your head up.